Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. We're continuing our series of talks about Shimura varieties and positive characteristic. And today, today we're very happy to have Elena Montavon. And she'll be speaking on density of primes of ordinary reduction for abelian varieties with simple signature. Uh, so Elena, is it, is it all right if we video this talk? Yes, that's fine, really. Thank you. And thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to, to speak at this series. Um, if you don't mind me asking for people to turn on their video, <laughs> that would be great. And also, I don't mind at all having questions along the, you know, being interrupted and asking questions. So no need to wait till the end. That will be fine by me. In fact, I like it. Okay, so, um, sorry. What I'm going to talk about today is about joint work in progress with uh, Victoria Control for Fun, Wang Lin Li, Rachel Price, and Yunqing Tang, and is uh, an application of a geometry she would have in positive characteristic to a question of SER, which is uh, concerned with a properties of Galois representation, and in this case will be Galois representation attached to a billion variety defined over a number field. And for the purpose of today's talk, I'm just gonna focus on the case of a billion variety over very rational, and that's only to keep a notation and some of the statements slightly easier. And so my goal is to explain what this conjecture is and how does the geometry of Shimura varieties in positive characteristic plays a role and the statements of what we prove and then hopefully I have time to also discuss the strategy and what is known about Galois representation of abelian varieties and what's the input. Um, sorry. Okay, so here is my the conjecture of uh, SER. So let me set up some notation first. So let A be my abelian variety over Q, dimension G. And so for every rational number, I have a Galois representation, which is from the absolute Galois group of Q into GL to G uh, QL. So that's just in the endomorphism of it, first set cohomology of the abelian variety with QL coefficient and uh, define, you know, your base change to Q bar, and so you have a natural action of a Galois group. And the question I ask is like, well, if I take a prime P of good reduction for A, what can I say about the image of Frobenius at P inside GL2QL? And this is, I treat it as if it's an element, but as you know, the Frobenius is really a conjugacy class, it's only defined up to conjugation. So the question that I ask only makes sense up to conjugation. So it really is a question about, the conjugacy class, and since I'm focusing on the eigenvalue, you can think of it as a conjugacy class up to semi-simplification. In fact, it is known to be semi-simple. And so many things are known, mostly under the big uh, umbrella of what is known as a Vey conjecture. In particular, if you take an eigenvalues of Frobenius at P and you look at it, it's an algebraic number, and you can embed it into a complex number, and no matter what embedding you choose, is absolute value is always going to be uh, square root of p in this case. That's a theorem of the line. And the question I want to ask is really what I can say about the absolute value at p of this number. And in fact, I'll phrase it in terms of evaluation of the element at p. So just to give you some example, if you take an elliptic curve and you have two eigenvalues and the evaluation are either zero and one, that's known as the ordinary case, or Super well, one half, one half each, and this is a super singular case at P. If you have an abelian surface, then you have four eigenvalues, and then you have three cases. You can have uh, two zeros and two ones, that's known as the ordinary case, or you can have only one half or four times, that's a super singular, but you also can have something mixed, meaning some zero, a zero, a one, and two halves. And I just label that as half ordinary, half super singular. And if you go in genus in a dimension higher, then you get to see more uh, options. And more importantly, you also get to see other rational number, not just zero, one, and one half. Okay, so what is uh, this collection? This is known as a Newton polygon, meaning usually you depict this collection of the slopes of the eigenvalues has. Um, a polygon, which is convex, it starts at zero, zero, and ends at two GG. That's just reflecting the dimension of your cohomology. And it's symmetric. So if lambda is a slope, then one minus lambda is also a slope. This is reflecting the fact that your abelian variety is polarizable, and so the H1 has an inner pairing. What's most important is the slopes are rational number, and they're always between zero and one. 
So being rational or reflective factor is an algebraic number, but between zero and one is sort of a special input. And these are results to Grothendieck and Manning in the 70s. And so as an example, you always have the ordinary polygon that's just uh, G zeros and G ones. And it's a theorem of ORT uh, that in fact, no matter which polygon you take satisfying those conditions, which are referred to as a Newton polygon, and which prime you take, you can always find an abelian variety over FP bar with that Newton polygon. The question of Sarah is about is a sort of different organization of this question, meaning it says, I give you your abelian variety over Q and I fix a Newton polygon nu. What can you say about a set of prime P at which the Newton polygon of A is equal to nu? In particular, is it non-empty? Is it infinite? Or more precisely, can you tell me about its density? Uh, so this is a conjecture of Sir that I want to discuss, is a prediction that after passing to a finite extension of Q, then the set of, uh, of primes where the Newton polygon is new as natural density one, if you're looking at the ordinary polygon and zero everywhere else. So the only polygon basically which occurs for the natural density almost every time will be the ordinary one. Uh, that doesn't tell you that the average don't occur and they can even occur with, pos with uh, infinite many times, but there's just no information about that. And if you're not happy with passing to a finite extension, then the statement is saying that you always have a positive density of prime on, for which the ordinary polygon occurs already over the rational, and you can even bound it below if you know what L looks like. Um, does that make sense to everybody? I see question in the chat or comments, but please just, uh, I, it's a little tricky for me to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so those are just references that um, Drew has put in the okay, chat. Okay, perfect. So just give me an alert if I need to answer something. I just want to really monitor otherwise. Is that okay? Definitely. Okay. Perfect. So just seeing the case of elliptic curves and a billion surface, what is this conjecture says is the following. So suppose you have an elliptic curve of a Q then Sarah's actually proved that the statement is true in this case. And in fact, if your elliptic curve is not CM, you don't need to pass to any finite extension. You have a density one over Q already. And actually Shimura Tanayama 10 years earlier showed that if you have CM, then in fact you have density one, but only after passing to the quadratic imaginary field, which defined the complex multiplication. Over Q, you have density one half. Uh, for a billion surface, a statement on Sarah's conjecture was proved by Katz in 82, and it's only much recently that Savin was really able to pin down the value of the density over Q for the ordinary prime, and this is either one, one half, or one fourth, depending on the endomorphism of algebra of A, and I'll say a little bit more about that. But so that's what uh, this statement looks like in these two cases. And uh, so what has this to do with the geometry of Shimura variety? So introducing Shimura variety is never a fun job and I'll try to keep it minimal. And so I'm just trying to set up a little bit of notation for what I need. Um, it's also somehow emphasizing the different perspective that you can have when discussing Shimura varieties. So in general, um, you say Shimura variety corresponds to the choice of a Shimura datum, which really means it comes from the choice of a connected reductive group, so GL2 or GSP4 in the two examples I just discussed, GSP2G in higher dimension, and an X. And so in the Shimura's approach, this X is what is called a her Hermitian locally symmetric domain with an action of the real point of G. And the point is, if in these settings, if you choose your gamma to be a discrete subgroup of a rational point of G, and you take it sufficiently small, so very distortion free, then the quotient of X by gamma is a complex manifold. And it's actually a theorem of Bailey Borel that really is the, you can be identified with uh, the complex points of an algebraic variety. And so Shimura's idea was that under some condition on G, you can actually view this algebraic defining has been defined over a number field. And his work, his theorems are really about what this number field looked like. And they're defined in terms of its property of the algebraic forms of G of level gamma. So in fact, Shimura was interested in an algebraic result, algebraicity for, uh, for uh, modular forms and automorphic form, and that was his perspective. And that's how he introduced his theory and proved this theorem. And it was really Deligne who brought sort to of a kind of perspective that now is more common in arithmetic geometry, which is sort of bypassing the mentioning the 
Hermitian local symmetric domain, which is a complex manifold, but it just regards the input of X as sort of a conjugacy class of certain co-character of a real point of G from uh, S1. So this is like a, is sort of a restriction of scalar from a complex number down to real number of GM. So just called like the delineators. And these co-characters are sometimes referred to as Hodge structure. And the point is in these settings and the quotient of X mod gamma has a nice modular interpretation as parameterizing Hodge structure. And the, the part which is sort of uh, comes to play in arithmetic geometry, uh, other example also do, but this is the easiest one. If your G is a subgroup of GSP2G and your character has weights minus one, zero, and zero minus one, this is what people sometimes refer as a Shimura data or Hodge type. Then in this case, the Shimura variety, meaning the algebraic variety whose complex point look like X mod gamma, this actually has a natural interpretation and modulus space of a billion variety with some additional structure. And so with this perspective and using Manford GIT, you can see that this is an algebraic variety defined over some number field and you can determine the number field in terms of a Shimura datum, and that's usually referred as a reflex field. And so that's really the perspective I'm taking today, is sort of the linear description of Shimura's work. And so let me give you an example of what like a sub reductive subgroup of GSP2G looks like. So this is an example known as PEL type, uh, where the E stands for endomorphism. And the idea is that, so let me denote by V and the brackets here to be the standard representation GSP2G. Um, and let B be a, well, I just wrote a semi-simple central algebra over F, but you can think of it to be a field or a division algebra over a field, but I want this field to be either a CM field or a total real field. And then under this condition and some compatibility with dimension, you might be able to define a B module structure on V. And if you can, then it makes sense to look at the subgroup inside GSP2G of those transformation of V, which preserve the pairing up to a scalar, but also which are B linear. And these define a reductive subgroup of G. So that's a prototype of what a connected reductive subgroup of G looks like. And the corresponding Shimura variety then is kind of easier also to describe, meaning is a modular space of polarized abelian variety, which have multiplication by your algebra B, meaning which are equipped with an embedding of B inside the endomorphism algebra. So what is the X in this case? Well, the X encodes as a morphism class of a Lie algebra of A as a B tensor C module. And, uh, and so, for example, in the case where B is just a, a field, then it's really just recording the dimension of the, the pieces of a Lie algebra where F acts multiplication by a certain embedding tau of F into the complex number. So it's just like you can view as sort of just recording these dimensions and nothing else. Because, uh, well, in that case, it's just vector spaces, a decomposition of vector spaces. Well, um, does that make sense? So it was a little too fast. Is that okay? So this is a prototype of what is called a PL type Shimura variety. And these are the kind of variety I will be using today. And so why is the geometry of Shimura varieties relevant at all to the question of survey that I offered at the beginning? And here is the, the perspective. Is suppose you know your abelian variety as multiplication by B and you have this signature. Sorry. Then um, in this case, your abelian variety can be viewed as a point on the corresponding Shimura variety. And so if it happens that you know that some polygon does not occur ever on the reduction of your Shimura variety, meaning there is no point of a Shimura variety with that polygon, then of course the corresponding set for A has to be empty too. So, I mean, you might think this is naive, but in fact, we, we do know which polygon occur on Shimura varieties and they are, many fewer polygons are the ones that occur in general on the Ziegel variety. So this perspective does bear some insight. Um, so for example, here's what we know. And this are, is a theorem which is due to many, many people. The name I put here are those which are first proved instances of the theorem for PL type Shimura varieties, not known for Hodge type, and even in generalization for a, a billion variety of a billion type. But the idea is that you take P to be unramified. So this condition is to making sure that your Shimura variety is good reduction. 
And then you can consider the reduction mod P of Ishimura variety is the locus consisting of those points whose Newton polygon is equal to nu. And the first thing to know is that this is actually a locally closed subspace and it's known as a Newton stratum of Ishimura variety. And whether it's empty or not is well understood by a theorem of Beeman and Vathorn. And it's only if a case where nu belongs to a specific set, which is known as a Kautwitz set. I mean, it was a conjecture of Kautwitz exactly which stratum will occur. So in particular, if you take your ordinary polygon, which is the one in Sars conjecture, that set might be empty. In fact, it's not empty if only if P is not, sorry, it's solely split in the reflex field. And more precisely, the theorem, which is due to Vedern, is the fact that there is always a unique non-empty and open stratum in your Shimura variety. It's called a mu ordinary stratum. And the corresponding polygon, which is called a mu ordinary polygon, is the ordinary polygon if and only if P is totally split, but it will be a different polygon at primes which are not split. And so you see, this means that if you're looking at the prime over Q, which are ordinary for your abelian variety A, they're forced to be a subset of a prime which are totally split in the reflex field. And, and now you can start seeing some of the feature of cell conjecture, because these set on the right hand side will have density which is positive, but might not be one if uh, E is not Q. And will become one if you pass to a finite field extension, namely if you pass to E. And so that is a feature of a conjecture you can see just by looking at the geometry of Shimura variety. Does that make sense? Okay. So with this in mind, we're gonna have to, you know, to optimize, you wanna speak about the smallest Shimura variety containing A that will carry the most information about this set. And, and this actually makes sense, meaning you can think, if you describe the Hodge structure of A in terms of a, a co-character from the Delini torus in Delini, then you can speak, of, well, you can define what is called the Montfortite group of A. This is just a smallest subgroup connected reductive defined over Q inside GSP2G, such that the character factors through this subgroup, okay? So such a subgroup always exists. And in fact, this is really the perspective of the linear definition. Ashimura variety is the linear definition. A is a modular space of a billion variety whose mom for take group is realized as a subgroup of G. And that's the idea. And so if you take your G to be the mom for take group of A and the corresponding conjugacy class, then you get the smallest Shimura varieties of Hodge type containing A. And if you don't like to work with Manfort groups, meaning if you don't want to try to figure out what's the smallest algebraic subgroup of GSP2G where you factor through, you can sort of think just simply in terms of endomorphism of A, meaning you can consider B to be the endomorphism algebra of A. And it's actually a theorem, I think, of um, Manfort that the maybe older, that the Hodge structure is B linear. So the fact the if you can write the Hodge structure as a co-character, we'll factor through the subgroup GB that I defined before. In other words, you can define by using this B, the smallest Shimura variety of PL type containing A. These are all the billion variety with a multiplication by B and which belongs in the same conjugacy class. Um, but you lose something. I mean, there are a billion variety out there whose Montfortet group is not of Hodge type, meaning, it's, sorry, it's not a PL type, meaning it's not cut by the endomorphism. These are known as a billion variety with exceptional cycles. And that's why these condition by, you know, just replacing a Hodge, which may Montfortet group with a group of a cut by endomorphism, you might be losing some information, okay? Uh, but luckily not in our case. So I think it's time, uh, unless there are any questions, to introduce what it, our results, in particular, what it means to be of type four and simple signature. Okay. Um, I should have said this maybe before, but I, it's no loss to assume that A is uh, absolutely simple. This question is uh, about isogeny classes, isogeny behavior. And so you might as well do it inductively for simple variety, absolutely simple, abelian variety. And so to be a type four means that your endomorphism algebra is a division algebra over a CM field. And just to keep it simple, let me assume that it is a CM field, okay? And that's my F. And then signature, as I said, is sort of recording the dimension on the 
the composition of the Lie algebra. And if you fill the CM field, then the embeddings comes as a conjugate pair. And I'm assuming that this conjugate pair, the value is zero N for almost all of them and one N minus one and all the others. So N is what is called the relative dimension of A over F. And as it turns out, the sum of F tau and F tau star is always equal to N. So this condition is say I want it to be zero N and one N minus one only once. Uh, this is the kind of condition you see when you, for example, in the Shimura variety study by Harris and Taylor, uh, which call them simple, and that's why I call this simple. And so that's the kind of abelian variety this talk is about. And the corresponding Shimura variety, well, so you know the Manforte group is a subgroup of this group GF, which is in the classification of a reductive group is a type A now. But under the restriction I put on the signature, this actually turns out has to be equal to GF. So meaning there are no Shimura varieties of type for a simple signature with exceptional cycle. And this is just coming from classification or reductive group. This type of reductive group GF, all these subgroup are also a PL type. So there is no Hodge type in this case. And so I'm at this condition, implies that the Manfred group is a PL type and is cut by F. Is that okay? So these are the kind of Shimura varieties I'm discussing today. And here is our theorem. We prove Sars conjecture, meaning we prove that if you have an abelian variety defined over a number field, in this case, I'm writing Q, uh, which has a type four and simple signature, then after passing to some finite extension, the set of ordinary prime is then still one. But actually we prove a little bit of a stronger statement. And so, which I put here as theorem B, we prove that if you assume in addition to the type four and simple signature, that the CM field is a abelian extension of Q. So it's Galois with abelian Galois group. And that the multiplication by F on A is defined over F, then in this case, you can prove that the set of mu ordinary prime, meaning the set of prime where the Newton polygon is all in the lowest possible polygon allowed on the corresponding Shimura variety, this has density one, okay? So this is like mildly stronger statement. And let me explain what it means and how it compares to the Serf's conjecture, unless there are any questions, okay? So Serf's conjecture, I said, is really a, a statement about what is the density of a set of polygons, or sorry, a set of prime where the polygon is equal to a given prime nu after you assume that L is sufficiently large. And theorem B is really this computes a density for any L. That's the difference. It does not, it removes a sufficiently large assumption. And so this is what the statement looks like if you kind of span it out. It tells you that this density, if the polygon is ordinary, is exactly one over the degree of FL over L. And so you can see it's one if L contains F, and otherwise it's strictly less than one, but always positive. If a polygon is not ordinary, but it's mu ordinary, it tells you that a set of prime where, for which nu occurs is always infinite. So that's what is special about this statement. It gives you some information that other polygons and you can compute the, the density. And in fact, the density is positive if and only if, I should say, L does not contain F. And you can explicitly compute what the density looks like. And if your polygon is not mu ordinary, then the density is zero. And I can say absolutely nothing about whether the set is finite or infinite. Uh, so I, this is really just the same statement as B. So it's not a, you know, it's sort of a spanning out that dense version which says density of mu ordinary polygon equal one. So let me explain how you compute it just in the first case, okay? Um, the idea is that if you consider a reflex field, I told you before, the insight is coming from the fact that the ordinary primes are all of it inside the primes which are totally split on E. And in fact, Vedern theorems is stronger. It says that the ordinary prime is exactly the mu ordinary prime which are totally split in E. And so if you know that the mu ordinary prime density one, these two set have the same identity, same density. 
And then all you need to know is that if you're looking at this variety, which are called simple Shimura variety, then the reflex field is isomorphic to F. And then you compute the density using Chimpotala density theorem, and that's it. So really, this is just like the long phrasing, but they're completely equivalent. Once you know theorems about geometry of Shimura varieties. Is that all right? Okay, so maybe before I go with this kind of phrasing, how does this compare to the theorem I mentioned before? And so for an elliptic curve and for a billion surface, the stronger version of a theorem is known. Um, for elliptic curve, you need to put together the theorem of Shimura Tanayama for CM and Serre's theorem. And for surfaces, you need to put together the lower dimensional case with a recent work of Sawin which consider uh, irreducible abelian surfaces. And of course, it's also known for CM abelian variety. The statement is stronger in that case because the Shimura Tanayama formula is really a statement that says that all unramified primes are mu ordinary. So it's not a density one. This is really all, except apparently many. Uh, version A, meaning Sir's conjecture, was proved by Katz for the abelian surfaces. And then uh, in the late 90s by Pink, under the assumption that endomorphism ring of A is trivial and that the Manfred Hill group is small. And more recently, Fite completed the proof for a billion three folds and also considered the case of a billion uh, a variety of dimension four under the condition that your multiplication by a quadratic imaginary field and signature to be type two, two. And so just to give you an idea, if you put together this, with our results on the case of CM that covers all abelian variety of dimension four and type four, okay? Because you could have multipl real multiplication and that is not considered. Um, so that's basically how it compares to previous rework. Maybe before I go, I just one more remark on the assumptions that I have. Um, so, well, it's, you can find plenty of same fields out there. You can choose your signature to be simple, lots of options, just pick your N and pick your favorite embedding. Uh, you can certainly find the CM field, which are a billion over Q, like a cyclotomic field. Uh, the theory of Shimura varieties, it's really out there to tell you that no matter what choice of F and signature you have, you will always find an abelian variety over a number field, which has that endomorphism at that signature. Okay, so in other words, there's conjecture, always have plenty of example even under this assumption. The theorem B, meaning the stronger version, require your abelian variety to be defined over you know, some, some particular shape field. So in particular, I told you, you can think of it as to be Q, and it wants a multiplication to be defined over the field F. And so this condition is stronger, but there are still plenty of example and so I just want to give you a concrete one so that you can see that theorem B really does occur and carries more information than the one predicted by Sarah. So this is an example. Um, it's actually, this example goes back to Shimura in 63. It's one of the very first examples of Shimura varieties ever considered. Um, and it's sort of an example where the abelian variety are coming as Jacobian of curves. So I'm considering a curve, which is a, given by this equation, that's like a cyclic cover of P1 of degree five. Uh, and I'm gonna take a T to be rational so that the curve is defined over the rational. And then I have multiplication by the roots of the fifth root of unity just by looking at multiplication by zeta five on the Y coordinate, which means that the Jacobian of this curve has multiplication by the cyclotomic field zeta five. So that's an example of a CM field, which is a billion over Q. And also by the very definition, you can see that the action or multiplication by zeta five is defined over Q zeta five. So it satisfied that extra hypothesis. And so the point is, if you take an abelian variety, if a C which does not correspond to a CM abelian variety, and for a, true, a general curve in this family, there is always, you know, this is true. Then you have that the endomorphism is exactly equal to the cyclotomic field 
Q Z a five, and you can compute the signature and the signature is simple. And so this is just one example. There are many other families of secret cover of P1, which sort of have this hypothesis satisfied. And so for these examples, theorem B is stronger and more, it carries more information that the actual, the just the conjecture of set that we prove. Is that okay? Okay. Then uh, unless there are any questions, which I'll be happy to take, I'm gonna discuss the strategy on how to prove such a theorem. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Forgot there is one more slide. This is what the theorem looks like for this curve. <laughs> Apologize. <laughs> it's just I just want to show you that basically you can, can easily compute the new ordinary polygons. This is what they look like in this case. That's like uh, you can see new new denominators coming in because there's a curve of genus eight. Um, sorry, genus four. The the type of polygon depends on the congruence class of P mod five, which means depends on the behavior of P in the cyclotomic field Q zeta five, and because you know the density of the congruence classes, then you can compute explicitly the density of these uh, polygons how often they occur, and so you see it's one fourth, one fourth, one half, and one and zero once you pass to Q zeta five, just as in search conjecture. So it's very very explicit if you choose your data. Sorry, so that is what the theorem looks like in this case. Um, and so now comes the strategy. And so the strategy goes back to Sir, his first instance proof for a billion variety for elliptic curves without CM in 77. And so there's sort of a here, well, there's sort of two input. Let's uh, hear how it goes. So let me just again notation A is my elliptic curve, not CM. Uh, I'm looking at represent. I assume it's over Q, so I have a representation of the absolute Galois group of Q, and because it's an elliptic curve, this goes in gel to QL. So the first observation of star is the observation I put at the beginning. If you're not ordinary, you're going to have to be super singular, and then you can do a computation of what the super singular uh, H1 that I'm of a super singular elliptic curve looks like, and it's uh, explicit computation that the Trace of Robinius is always zero. These are like a, one of the first example of the computation of Grothendieck. And so it tells you that the Newton polygon is not ordinary if and only if a trace is zero. Okay, so here's what Sars proved. This is a beautiful proposition which will be used over and over, including our theorem. It says if you have an algebraic connected group over QL and you have a subset of the QL points which is closed and stable under conjugation. And on the other hand, you have a Galois representation who has dense image. I mean, it's a risky dense here. Then if Z has hard measure zero, the set of prime P such as Frobenius lands in Z as density zero. So you can start to compute the density you're looking for in terms of a hard measure of your Z. And of course, what's the example he has in mind is when I take Z to be the cut by the trace equals zero condition. And uh, well, this is clearly closed under and also stable under conjugation because anything which is then is cut out by traces or polynomial in terms of traces and determined is stable under conjugation and will have hard measure zero. And that is because you can see that if you think of it in terms of a risky topology, this is closed of co dimension one. And so that makes it a hard measure zero in the Lali topology. And so all it's left to do, and I, I'm joking here because, of course, that's the hard part, <laughs> is to show that if A doesn't have CM, but the image of a Galois representation as the risky image is all of GL2. And that's really the big theorem of Sarah behind the proof of his conjecture in this case. And of course, that's also the part that fails for CM in this phrasing, meaning the image of a Galois representation, if you're elliptic with CM, is not the whole of GL2. It's sort of related to, it's a torus coming from the from the CM field, but also in general is not connected. Over Q is not gonna be connected, it has two connected components. So, so that's uh, that's a proof of SER for, um, for, a billion, for elliptic curve. And so before I generalize it to our settings, I just wanna go and give you the proof in dimension two. 
and I'm just going to follow uh, this is following work of Deligne and Katz, which prove, uh, as I remind you, with Sars conjecture in 82. Is that okay so far? I just want to do this case to see how things are changing before we dive into higher dimension. So um, again, the fan over Q, not CM, the Galois representation now lands in GSP4. And it's still true, but if you're not super singular, then your trace, if you are super singular, your trace is zero, okay? Trace of Frobenius is zero, same computation. The problem is if you're not ordinary, that doesn't make you super singular. You could be super singular, or you can be, as we said, that half ordinary, half super singular, meaning you have slope zero, one half, one half, one, okay? So in other words, the invariance coming from the trace of Frobenius does not detect ordinariness, it attacks super singularity. You need a new invariant. That's actually was the linear site. Um, and here is the invariant. You want to look at the trace of Frobenius, not on the H1, but on the H2 of your abelian variety. And that works in the sense that you're not going to be ordinary if and only if P divides a trace. Well, P divided a trace is not the same as a trace equals zero. It's a little different, but you can rephrase it and you can sort of replace it actually to say that a trace of a certain representation, meaning the wedge two and the twist by the character is integral. So it can be sort of replaced as an integrality condition for some algebraic representation on just before. And the point is, if you use a way conjecture, you see that this trace is absolutely bound independently of P. And that's really the, the cool part about this invariant There's just, in absolute value at most six, which means you're not ordinary if and only if your, val your trace takes value, well, not just zero, but minus six, minus five, minus four, blah, 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 all the way to six. Still okay, still close, still conjugates invariant, um, still hard measure zero. And so you just, uh, then cat's input, same as in uh, case of ser. What is left is to compute the image of a Galois representation inside GSP4. And Katz did that by passing to some finite extension. And the input in the Sawin paper is a result of Fite, Kid, Laya, Roger, and Sutherland, which proves the statement without having to pass to a finite extension. And so that's what the proof likes, looks like for uh, dimension two. And so now we can dive in uh, dimension, higher dimension. Uh, but maybe, unless there are any questions, before that, I want to tell you what we know about the image of a Galois representation for a general billion variety. Because as you can see, that's sort of a crucial ingredient in what we're planning to do. Is that OK? Any questions? OK. Sorry, catching time. Okay, so what we know about the Galois representation? Well, so there's a risky closure of the image of a Galois representation as a name is called the Eladic monodromy group of A. So let's call it that way. And I already remarked that if you take the CM case, what you get is something which is not connected. And so let's start by discussing what the connected components of this group look like. Okay, so it's a theorem of uh, Alice Silverberg and uh, Arsen and Pink from the 90s, that actually the, connected, the group of a connected component of Eladic monodromy of abelian variety does not depend on L. And the way it's actually proved is you can sort of identify a finite Galois extension of Q independent of L, such that when you took a, the, you know, look at the map rho AL, it gives you an isomorphism between that Galois group and the connected components of the monodromy group. So that's how you see it's independent of L. What's important for us is that if A does not have exceptional cycles, which is our settings, then actually this extension can be described explicitly is exactly the field of definition of the endomorphism of A. So there you go. Um, these are all the features are really coming together, meaning now you know where you want to pass to some finite extension. That's the same as saying you can assume that your monodromy group is connected. Um, and under our assumption, that funny condition that I want the multiplication of uh, F to be defined over F 
is bounding this extension Q con, that's a usual notation, so it's not exactly the prettiest, by saying that has to be contained in F. And so if you put all together, what it means is that I have a surjection from the Galois group of F to the group of connected component of my abelian variety. Sorry, of the Eladic monodromy of my abelian variety, which by the way, makes Eladic monodromy group an abelian group, which is gonna come handy later on, okay? But so now this is sort of explains with additional condition how they play into the general statement. Uh, okay, so that's it for the connected component. What about the identity component of the monodromy group? Uh, that's really the content of the Montfortet conjecture that the monodromy, the identity component of the Ladic monodromy group of an abelian variety is the QL point of the Montfortet group. Um, it's known by a result of faultings in the 80s that it is sort of the QL point of a reductive group, so a connected reductive group over Q. So the recipe is, is that the rec that reductive group has to be the Mumford group. So it's defined in terms of the Hodge structure of A. And for the billion variety of type four, with some restriction of a signature, which in particular include any simple signature. This the Mumford conjecture is known and is a theorem of Basio. Well, in fact, I think first instances of the Mumford conjecture for type four are going back to the work of Shimura. In other words, those assumption of simple type four tells you that the identity component of the Latin monodromy group is exactly the QL point of my group GF. And so if you just want to prove Sarah's conjecture, meaning if you want to are willing to pass with some finite extension, that that finite extension is my Q column. And over there, my Ladic monodromy group is just GFQL. And so I know what the image of, of the Galois represent, representation looks like, and I can implement the strategy that Sarah's and the linear cats used to prove the theorem. And that's really what we're going to do. Is that OK? Okay, so here we go. As the proof. Um, yes, I'm going fast. Sorry, is this is am I speaking too fast? Or I get that's is it okay? Okay, it's I, good. Good, it's good. Okay, so let me just do the case of theorem A first. Okay, just do the ordinary case. So what do we need to do? I don't know. I think uh, it wasn't obvious from Sarah's version of the proof, but from the linear cats, they, they cannot really spell it out in a way that can be approachable, meaning step one, you're gonna have to find an invariance we detect ordinariness. <laughs> meaning you want something that tell you that if a neutral polygon of A is not ordinary, then this invariant takes finitely many value. And the trick is um, make your absolute value to be sort of this invariant to be absolutely bounded independently of, a, of P, uh, ideally using the vague conjecture. And on the other hand, you want to make it integral. And this computation will rely on the geometry of Shimura varieties because, as you saw in the case of uh, both for elliptic curves and for abelian variety, you're going to have to know what are the options are if you're not ordinary. And for those options, you need to make sure that you take integral value. If you don't know what the options are, then of course you cannot prove this theorem. And if you cast yourself broadly on any dimension in a billion variety, you know, in a G, in a Ziegold modular variety, then you won't get the right answer. I mean, there is uh, that that's where things fail. Um, but of course, you also need to be able to write these invariants as a trace of some algebraic representation, because uh, that's how you want to use, you want to use like a Serre's conjecture, Serre's proposition, right? You want to use this statement about the hard measure of Z imp implying density zero for something. And, and so you're going to identify this as to be some trace of some algebraic representation that you want to compute it on your monodromy group. I Meaning you want to make sure that on the monodromy group, this Z really has the right property. So close and stable under conjugation is guaranteed by the way you define it. You just have to ensure that it's hard measure zero. And as I said, you wanna make sure that you're really cutting something which has positive co-dimension. Um, just to give you an example, if you take the anti-diagonal torus inside GL2 and you take the standard representation, that's how you fail <laughs> because that will always have trace zero. 
And, you know, and so being trace zero doesn't cut something on co-dimension one in that specific example. So that's just to give you what that kind of computation you need to do. You just want to make sure that you didn't put yourself in a weird spot. But if you can prove a ZS hard measure zero, then you will deduce that the set of ordinary prime after passing to this finite extension, which is very explicit, as density one. Okay. So that's um, that's the idea. Sorry, I wrote F Q con, but it's really F. Right, I told you uh, Q count is containing F, so it should be saying F. That's a typo. Sorry. Okay, so that's a strategy. So we just have to find an invariant. And so that's where the input from the Shimura varieties comes very strongly in, meaning we know that we might as well assume that the prime is split inside F of a Q. Because it's not, then ordinary will never occur and will be useless. And so we're gonna assume P is totally split in F. And I'm gonna look at the H1 that I'm of the billion variety. That's an action of F tensor QP. And the point is, if P is totally split in F, because then the, this action of, the fraction of Frobenius on VP is actually F Q linear. And this is very, is true only because of this assumption over here. And so, but it's, it is F, P, F uh, tensor QP linear. So I can make a trace of this Frobenius as a F tensor QP linear map. So not just the usual trace, but trace with respect to this action. And then it's a theorem of uh, kissing, which tells you that this element will be integral, is an integral element in F. So it's not just in F Q tensor QP, it's not just in F, it's really in O of F, okay? So I'm gonna take my trace, my norm down to, to Q, and that gives me an uh, integer. And if you use a vague conjecture, you compare them to what you're doing. And this integer is bounded by a constant, which is a dimension of uh, um, H1 that I'm as a F vector space times P to the D, where D is a degree of, um, of your CM field divided by two. Okay, so not what I wanted, but if I divide by P to the D, what I wanted, right? Absolutely bound. And you saw already in, uh, the linear approach for G2 by dividing by P that correspond to twisting by the similitude character. So that's, an, that's okay. Meaning I can write this as a trace of an algebraic representation. Uh, it's not really an algebraic representation of GSP to G because I took the trace as F linear trace, but it's a representation of GF, which is just big enough for what we wanna do because that's where our monodromy group is. So that's good. All I have to do is make sure that this does detect ordinariness. And as I said, this is really a computation on the Shimura variety, meaning I'm gonna compute what the polygons at the prime, which are totally split in F are, and I'm gonna make sure that for each one of them is always a case that this is integral value. And so that's a very explicit computation, which comes from the combinatorial description of the Kotlitz set. And once you do this, the fact that this trace cuts something of hard measure zero in GF is uh, kind of obvious. And so that implies Serre's theorem. You're completely done. And so the key input, as I said, it comes from the theory of Shimura varieties and some ingenuity in defining your invariant. Okay, so I think I'm, um, I'm kind of running out of time and so, um, I don't know, I can, if, well, I have two minutes, but maybe I'll stop here. And if you wanna know about the next step, it's a little bit more delicate, of course, and it uses additional condition, but maybe this is enough for today. Oh, thank you, Elena. Sorry. You. Would anyone like to um, ask any questions? Hi, Mia, yes. It, hi, uh, it seems that you use the simple signature condition uh, sort of many places uh, and it's uh, sort of all tied up in everything, but could you point out a couple simple places um, where it's yes. important? Yes, so I think the, 
I mean, the most crucial place is uh, for those I can really make sure that I, the Manfort group is the whole of GF. Um, but I think that you might be able to get away with uh, more than just, you know, something weaker, but simple for that statement to hold. Uh, but really, the, the computation here about making sure that for anything which is not ordinary, I'm detecting ordinariness. This really crucially used simple. And the point is, maybe I have a slide here, is that this simple, first of all, the cutlet set, it's, you can compute it, but it's much easier to compute under a simple condition. You can really write out explicitly what this polygon looks like. And they're also particularly nice because this is what is called a totally order set. Meaning like in the case of elliptic curve, open space, next one down, they're all like, a, you know, one after the other co-dimension dropping at every step. In general, also for uh, starting for genus, uh, for dimension bigger than uh, two, this is not true for Ziegel variety and it's not true for Shimura variety. You can have things which are not totally ordered and that makes the computation harder to make sure that you detect ordinariness meaning there is no polygon which sort of escapes your invariant. And, uh, and the other feature that I use, but that will also will be true in general, is that somehow this set only depends on the restriction of Frobenius at F, my element in F. So that's true in general. So I think really what I need is this totally order and the fact that it's relatively easy to compute explicitly the copy set. Uh, this set you. also, if you wrote this, same invariant here um, for non-simple will just not work. <laughs> the problem with invariance is that you can try to use some ingenuity, but the most obvious one, they always seem to escape something. You know, there's a polygon escape, or it's just not well-defined all the time. And so you just need to be very careful. And so this invariant works because the signature is how I chose it. Which doesn't mean there is no invariant out there for the other ones, means I'm not, it's not this one. Thank you. Well, let's see, Hadi, do you want to ask your question yourself? Or, um, uh, maybe I'll read this question. Uh, does everything go through similarly if the abelian variety is defined over a number field? And that's from um, Hadi. Oh yeah, hi Hadi. Uh, yes, it's um, it's just a statement look a little different. You can see, you, you know, here is easy. I just use f over q to give you the computation, but I will need to use f l over l, and uh, and then that it you know that looks slightly different. But that's that's about it. There is no impact, and of course, the only other things is here. I'm using any prime as long as it just totally split in f. Uh, in the general case, I want my prime also to be starly split in the field um, L, the field of definition. That's the density one set of prime, so it's totally fine. But so you just need, you know, my notation will be a little bit more complicated, but that's about it. There is no, nothing else. 